I'm sorry, but I um, clean forgot in my welcome to welcome Paul <laughs> officially. So um, Paul Bennett um, is with us today and we're really happy to have you here again, Paul. And um, we look forward to your message. Thank you. Thank you very much. Look, I've got some, some books here. I should just say this from the beginning so then I don't have to worry about it. These uh, books are put out by the General Conference, the AMR Department, their study books. Uh, one's, one is What Does the Holy Quran Say About the Holy Bible? One is What Does the Holy Quran Say About the Descent of Issa al Masih? In other words, Jesus Christ. What does the Holy Quran or the Quran say about this? The other one is a pack of study guides. Uh, that we do with Muslims and this is uh, just a little handout where a Muslim uh, it's a great testimony book where he became a follower and an SDA in particular so the work we do is not just in Indonesia we've been doing this in Indonesia for a long time but the AMR work the Adventist Muslim relations work in Australia is active and alive and so I shared in Sabbath school some of the things that we're doing in Australia, whether it be Melbourne, uh, Newcastle or Sydney. Um, there's lots, lots to get your hands involved with. I was recently in... I should just start with a little prayer. Our Father, we thank you once again that we can just all commit our lives to you here and bow and pray that you will bless our time together, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. I was in a mosque three weeks ago, one evening, and I was down the front, and it's a mosque where they really appreciate SDAs. And the, grand, the retired Grand Mufti from Egypt was there, and he gave a presentation, and then at the end of it, he invited me up to give my presentation. There was about 100 people there. It was being broadcast all around the world, is that what they do in this particular mosque. And I was able to share, I certainly supported what he said because it was a good, really good presentation. And then I was able to share about the fourth angel, the loud cry. And we know what the fourth angel is. Revelation 18 verse 1. And this, time, this is coming just in the near future. Revelation 18, verse 1. And after these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. The earth was lightened with his character, the character of of our Lord and Saviour. This time is just before us. And how are we preparing for this? This is the work of AMR. You know, Muslims make up about 1.8 billion people in the world. And how are we bridging this? And so this is the work that I've been involved in and, and other people. I'm thankful for Paul and Vilma who has, they have come over. Uh, a number of times and working in the area uh, of Indonesia we know Indonesia is the largest populated Islamic country in the world in saying that we have there are, the Adventists are very strong there we have many universities many hospitals many churches but it's just so large a missionary finally arrives home he spent many years in the field he went with his young wife, he had his children over there. And over the years, things just happened and he ended up coming home by himself. His wife passed away, his children moved on. And as he came home on a ship, there was a big celebration. It wasn't for him, it was for someone else that was on the ship. True story. And as he came in, he just kind of crossed his mind. I wonder if there'd be anyone that would be meeting me there. And as this very important person got off the ship, there were celebrations. He was, this other person that they were celebrating was finally getting home after, many, uh, after a few days, or a week or so, I think it was, of business and doing government work. It was pretty important. 
and they were very happy, very successful. But as this missionary got off and he went to his room that he had hired for that night, he knelt down beside his bed, a little bit sad that he was still, no one had come and he was by himself. And as he knelt down, he thanked the Lord. And then he heard the voice say to him, my son, you are not home yet. You are not home yet, my son. There will come a time. The loud cry will happen. But in the meantime, we have a work to do. My conviction in this work is that we, as Adventists, we have two main things to present to the world. We need to present the character of heaven. Jesus, the living word of the Father. That's really our priority, to present our Lord and Saviour in character, in action. And secondly, we are to warn and help people prepare and get ready to go home with that character. to go home to paradise, as we would say to a Muslim. To go home to the kingdom of heaven. Just see if this works. Oh, yeah. So today's talk is really on knowing the footprints of God. I recently attended a conference. Well, recently, it was uh, actually early this year, April, I think, in India. And we would call it a, uh, an insider uh, conference. And I must admit, even though I've been working in Indonesia for a number of years and I took a couple of our workers with us to this conference, my eyes were opened to what is really happening in the insider work around the world. This really backs up what I was just saying a minute ago. One subject of emulation must swallow up all others. Who will most nearly resemble Christ in character? Who will most entirely hide self in Christ? That's our calling. So this conference was basically... Um, sharing about what's happening in the contextualised uh, ministry. Now, a contextualised, the word contextualisation is viewed as making the message or the word of God relevant to our cultural settings. Uh, it is a term imported into theology to express a deeper concept of indigenization. Contextualization is viewed as making the message of God relevant to cultural settings. Kind of makes sense, doesn't it? I was sharing earlier in the, the Sabbath school program about the extraction message. You know, I was extracted from the Roman Catholic Church. No problem. But in certain cultures, you can't do that. It, it really doesn't work and in in the islamic world basically three things happen if you're extracted now this is this is general There's certainly um muslims do come into our, our message but it's not a uh, a common thing but three things happen uh, a third of them will go back into islam their culture a third of them will have to leave their country and a third of them will go mad, go crazy because they just can't cope with the, the breakdown of their whole family structure and the isolation because their religion is their family. That's everything. And so contextualization has come about because of the necessity and the, the uh, not just we want to be successful, we want to be gentle and kind to these families. 
So I was part of what we call in praxis. That's the name of a. It's an Adventist uh, supporting ministry to the church, redefining mission, empowering people, and basically it's dealing with unreached people groups in the the 1040 zone, which make up a lot. And I'll show you some figures in a minute. In praxis is an organ organisation that goes right to the GC. Even though it's not uh, officially under the umbrella of the GC, we have, um, you, you have people right to that level, right down to, uh, to the conference level. So some facts. Basically the world population grows at the moment about 82 million a year. The church, we're growing, at the most, we're growing about 800,000. So as you can see, it's getting further away. It's, it's rushing ahead, and we're moving at a pace, and successful when it comes to churches. But when it comes to finishing the work or getting things moved along, it's, it's getting further. Let me have a look here. And I should say another way to look at uh, this co contextualised approach is what, what I call bridging. You know, Adventists are very good at building a bridge with people. It's, it's a one-way bridge normally, meaning you, you come to me because I've got the, the message. And I, I don't doubt that we have the message or the last warning message to the world. We do. But it's how we go about this. You know, you, you come to me and then everything will be fine. Well, in actual fact, we need to do two-way bridges. We need to be actually able to go into a garbage can and get our hands dirty and be there. And let's, let's get out of here. Let's move on. So some other facts here. In the US today, 60% of Americans will never walk into a church structure today. At this conference, or consultation it was called, we had a, a gentleman who runs the, the Simple Church program for our world church, Milton Adams. And he works in America. He's been to Australia. He, he, he basically, he's building the, the system of Simple Church, uh, which is small groups. And these are some of the facts he he shared for, for the purpose of why the, the small group program is going to take over. And they are generally uh, it, across the board 60% of Americans will never walk into a structure again. Now let's think of us in Australia, we're probably worse than that. 104 million Christians have left structured church in the past 10 years. That's not at just SDA. They haven't left God, but they've, they're sick of doing big church. And of those 104 million, they represent the 10% of active or doers in the church. So these are the facts that he is presenting. In Bangladesh, around the time that I was there, it was about 60,000 people waiting for baptism at a cost of two American dollars. In the US, for one person, it costs around 100,000 US dollars. And that's taking into consideration the whole structure, you see. And it's just getting unreachable unless we go about things differently. And that's why the, this contextualised approach is being promoted and developed. Let me just have a look here. Okay. So just developing this a little bit more. Okay, it says 1.7 billion Muslims around the world today. Uh, Hindu, 800 million. Buddhist, 800 million. Tribal and unreached 
people groups, about 180 million people spread across 980 unreached tribal groups. So how are we going to do this with the way we're doing it? And I'm not saying we're doing it wrong, but is it the best way? You know, it suits us, and that's fine. You know, we're, we're successful here. Well, I, I trust we're successful. You know, we enjoy it. Can we learn anything from what's happening in this 1040 zone, which I'm about to share? I like this quote, this next one here from Ellen White. It says, God selects his messengers and gives them his message. And he says, forbid them not. New methods must be introduced. God's people must awake to the necessities of the time in which they are living. You know, we, we need to be aware of what's going on and we need to be prepared to make changes. Not to our message, not to the, the core of our message. That's, that's the foundation of heaven. But on, on how we do this. And that's really what uh, Impraxis is doing. Impraxis is financed by lay STAs from around the world. It is run by lay STAs from around the world. So um, it's, it's part of us. Okay. Now, there should be more. Well, that's all there was. Well, there you go. Don't know where they went. They were pretty important, but I've got them written here. Okay, so at this consultation, I, I went there. It was in India, Calcutta. Some people just couldn't get in. Because it's an underground movement, they were questioned at the airport. We were heavily questioned, and, but we got in. Others, they opened up their computers. They were on the first plane out. So we, we did have to be careful. Uh, some people just couldn't come. Uh, there was a group in Saudi Arabia, which I'll tell you about. They just, they, they, they're so much under the, the watchful eye of the Saudi Arabian government, they just couldn't even leave because it's just too dangerous for them. But at this conference, I walked in, and I'm sitting in a, a room, and I'm thinking, wow, this is a, uh, a mixed group of people. There's Hindus, there's Muslims, there's all sorts of people. But in actual fact, they're all SDAs, all of them. And so I'm, I'm there thinking, well, okay, this is, uh, this is going to be interesting. So we had group leaders from these movements. They came from many countries for this consultation. People came from East Africa, Somalia, Russia, Azerbaijan, Iran, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Saudi Arabia, the Philippines, Indonesia, and, of course, one from Australia. Some country representatives could not get to the consultation. Uh, it was far too dangerous. Uh, for example, in Saudi Arabia. And I'll tell you this little story. In practice, found a group of a, a number of villages, towns, that are followers of, they're Muslims, they're followers of Jesus. And in practice, is working with them. And this group believe all the doctrines that we hold, except one, the spirit of prophecy. You see, they, they didn't, yeah, they, they were questioned, well, where did you learn? Where did you learn? Where did you get your Bibles from? Oh, we, we didn't have a Bible. We don't have Bibles. We just have our Korans. And that's how it is. The only reason they didn't hold to the spirit of prophecy is because it's not in the Koran. All the other doctrines are, and that's why they hold them. And that's why they're under the watch care of the government. So they, they couldn't come. 
Uh, we had some other movements. Okay, some examples of these movements. Uh, these small group mo movements are very well organised. So, w what's happening in these these all these leaders? They represent movements, small group movements. They're all Sabbath keeping. They all hold what we hold, but they stay in their cultural setting. Some of these people are imams of huge mosques that run just like they normally would run. Some of them are people that give the call to prayer and leaders. They're chosen by the community, by the townspeople because of their righteousness and their dedication but they're Adventists. And they're growing these movements quicker than what we can think. They get to about 15 to 20 people and then they split. And they study, they meet on Sabbath, they all have their Sabbath programs and they do all their other cultural things because they stay in their, their place of origin. How they were born. They were brought up, they dressed like Muslim, they would pray five times a day, which is no problem anyway. And they go about there every day, but they hold what we hold. And not only that, they're actively growing the message of God. They'll probably never walk into an SDA church. Actually, they'll probably nev never support financially an SDA church even though they all pay tithe and they're, they're growing the movement or the message of God. They are under the watch care of our leadership. That we do know. But it's growing. It's growing quicker than what I could ever imagine. But you know, as I travel through some of these countries... I, think, I often used to think, how on earth are we ever going to reach these people? You know, in the city of Jakarta, there's 25 million people. Five million come in and out every day. Every week, 10,000 new cars enter the road system. You know, it just, it's mind-boggling. How, you know, how are we going to reach them? Well, the early apostolic church had the plan, didn't they? Small groups. They weren't large congregations. And I'm not saying this is all good, you know, we enjoy this. But other people are doing it differently to get our message, our last warning message to the world, to help prepare people character wise to meet their Lord and Saviour. So. We had a Somalian chief and leader there. Fascinating story. He rules over a third of Somalia. He finally went home. He became a Christian in Korea, learning English. Highly educated. He ended up in America. He became a translator. Finally he, got, uh, he accepted our message. And then, in practice, got a hold of him. He's been sent back, or he chose to go back, into the war-torn area of Somalia. It's a fascinating story. He, he got in by the skin of his teeth. They accepted him back, and he rules over a third of Somalia. And he's growing these small movements. In Sudan, we had leaders that couldn't leave because of the civil war. They were planned, they were there to come to our, this consultation. But they were running the country of Sudan. These are the guys that are growing these small groups. Spreading our message. In India, we have SDA Muslim movements. Now they represent, some of the leaders that were there... They represent 6,000 groups, just, as it, just in Calcutta. Each group is up from 10 to 15, so that's about 90,000 people. 
And so these people just in, in this little group are doing this and then probably, I'm not sure the time, but they say it's rapidly multiplying. They get to about 10 to 15 and then they split. You know, you, you just don't stay in a church and do, you know, what we're comfortable in doing. You, this, this is a, we've, we've got a job to do. That's their thinking. This is how they keep them on track and keep them focused. We, you know, it's... And that's how the early apostolic movement worked so quick. They, they didn't get caught up, and I've got to be careful here, I'm not saying that the structure's good, I'm, I'm not saying it's not good. You know, the education, we've got great things happening in all our education, in our local SDA school, in, in, in uh, Macquarie Fields, Macquarie, uh, Macquarie College. We've got over 60 Muslim students that we're working with. In Sydney, in Melbourne. So the structure's good. But in these other areas, we've got to do it differently. And this is what's happening. So in India, the Hindu movement, so it's not just Islam, it's in Hinduism too. So, so there were a lot of Hindus that were at this conference. They're all baptised STAs, mind you. And at that time they represented about 5,800 groups. So that's about 87,000 people, this small group were representing at this conference. In Bangladesh, <coughs> the SDA movements and the leaders, they represent about 6,000 groups, uh, two to four families a group, that's about 120,000 people and growing. The Philippines was interesting, down in Mindanao, people know about Mindanao, down it's a pretty hard line Islamic area, down south. We've got people that are actually, well, one of the Muslim ladies was there, you know, she was just a Muslim to me, but actually she was brought up an Adventist, born and brought up an Adventist, but she, she married into a, her husband would have been a Muslim, he wasn't there, he wasn't allowed in, but he converted to Christianity or to Adventism, they then contextualised, you might say, and went back into the Islamic world, and there they've got a thriving contextualised movement that is so organised and it's just multiplying. They share and, and they're in many mosques. They're openly reading the Bible in mosques and challenging and growing leaders in the Philippines. And it's our message. It's different to how we do it. You know, they probably don't look like me. They probably pray different. You know, they probably do a few other things different. So what? You know, Abraham prayed probably like Muslims pray. No problem. Cultural? That's fine. Muslims dress like probably Mary dressed. The mother of Jesus with a veil or something. It's about our message. It's not so much about us as a church, even though that's important, but it's about the message we represent. And how we share the lovely character of Jesus. Because that's what Jesus came to re represent, didn't he? He came to represent the heavenly character. And he became our saviour. So, in Azerbaijan, yeah, I could talk a lot on the Philippines, that's... Uh, it's exciting, but Azerbaijan, we have an SDA Muslim imam who serves in the large mosque and he was chosen by the people because his dedication. And they just ex accept him. He, they know he's an Adventist, but he's also a Muslim. <coughs> New methods must be brought about. We need to find better ways. The gap is getting wider in sharing the message. Let me finish with a... Uh, we heard lots of testimonies. How really exciting. And interestingly, this morning early, I was up early. There was um, four o'clock. Someone was texting me about the programs in Indonesia. But then I got a text from East Africa. 
And it was to, he was just saying, hello, how are you? I'm praying for you, whatever, which is great. But this is the testimony of this gentleman. So it, it came at a good time. There was a farmer working in a field. And as he was working away, a man appeared behind him or turned up, I'm not sure, and asked him what he was doing. He would have told him, and he said, Look, I want you to go to another village and visit this family. But I'm busy. I've got to make a living. I've got family. I've got kids. Look, I want you to do this. You do this? Okay, okay, I'll do this. I'll do this. Anyway, time went on. He didn't do it. A week or two passed, and again he was in the field working. And this person turned up there again. Hey, what's, what's going on? How, you didn't visit. Why didn't you visit? Yeah, I know, I know. I'm, I, I needed to. Okay, I will. And he agreed to do it. And that following Sabbath morning, he, wasn't, he was Muslim, but that following weekend, he decided to go and visit. So he took his wife and children. He took his neighbours, two neighbor, uh, husband and wife and their children. And they all went up the river on a boat. It was a few hours. And they came to the place and they parked. It was a Sabbath morning. And as they got out of the boat, it was down the hill, the person in the house was running a small group, one of these programs. And as he looked down, the, the, the elder in charge or, or the leader in charge recognised he said, I've seen this. He must have had a vision or, or a dream or something. I've recognised this. And so he went down and greeted them and brought them up and they spent the day together. They were thrilled. They had a great day. And at the end of the day, this farmer said, look, I, I just, this is fantastic news. I want to be baptised. And this elder then... Hmm, you know, we're not ready. Uh, you know, that's, that's good, we, but we need to, there's a process that needs to happen here. And this farmer, of course, said, well, that's good, but I actually accept what you've told me. We've had a great day. I agree. We've studied. We've looked at this, and I want to be baptised. I, I want to go this way, my family. And this elder was feeling a bit uncomfortable because, you know, we, we don't operate like that. And even this elder didn't operate like that, you know. And so he was challenged. And he said, look, please, we, we can't do it. It's, it's too early. We need to study. We need to get you ready. And I need to bring the official uh, elder or uh, the minister, or actually the one that texted me this morning uh, is an Adventist minister, who yeah, is in this field, and he brought him, uh, who's been doing this. So anyway, the conversation went on, and finally the elder or the leader said, okay, okay, I'll baptise you. <laughs> so they all went down that afternoon, evening, not sure, and they were baptised, all of them. And they were thrilled. And they packed up, they hopped in their boat, and they decided to go home. Very happy. Of course, the leader was a bit uncomfortable. He rang the minister, and he's the one that contacted me this morning, and explained it. And of course, the minister really went cranky on him. No, he didn't. <laughs> he actually said, good, you, you, you did the right thing. That, that was, that's fine. I, I support you. Uh, I understand. And that was good. But the next morning... the leader got a phone call and they were neighbours of the families that were baptised and they said look we're just trying to find our neighbours they were supposed to be home last night and they didn't turn up oh well they all went they all um, 
Yeah, they were here, we had a great day, and they went home. Oh, they haven't turned up. The story goes on, there was a huge storm on the way home. And everyone drowned that night. And so, I suppose the purpose of a story like that is that, yeah, we need to be prepared and ready to step outside the box to be led by God and these movements that are happening around the world uh, we need to rejoice we need to, to, to know that you know God is going to take this work into his hands his own hands and deal with it and are we broad enough are we big enough are we uh, willing to support even though it mightn't be in our little world and that's the work that uh, we're doing, not just in Australia, because these principles, like I shared this morning about my friend Muhammad, who I've been working with in Newcastle. He is what I call a person of peace. So we look for people of peace. When people of peace are open, they're willing to investigate. And if you come back this afternoon, those that are interested in knowing what really the Quran is teaching and how the Quran is pointing us back to the Bible. The Quran actually is pointing to Jesus as the Messiah. And I believe Saviour. But there's so much media hype out there and often people get confused between the system of Islam and what the Quran teaches. It's like people get confused about the system of Catholicism and what the Bible teaches. We know they're like that, don't we? We, we know that the system of Catholicism isn't at one with the Bible. You know, they might say it is. And you have to do the same thing. And that's where... Many people get very confused, including Muslims, because they're being led astray. We have a job to warn them. We have a job to prepare them. You know, the biggest interfaith study centre outside the Middle East is in the Vatican. They are wooing them in in so many ways. Who's warning them? Well, we need to be. We need to be blowing the trumpet because the fourth angel is coming and we need to have prepared the ground, the hearts, because this is the message that will go through and get people ready for eternity. And so if you're interested this afternoon, come back and it's, it'll be a sharing time, but we'll be looking at some PowerPoints and things that we do uh, to, um, to interact and to share and to grow uh, the faith of these people. Okay, thank you. Our Father in heaven, we, all of us here count it a privilege to be where we are and we just pray that you will inspire us and guide us and put it in our hearts and minds that we might... Uh, do the work and do the will of, uh, of yours and uh, the will of our Lord and Saviour. You know, so many times we feel very inadequate, we feel unprepared or we, we don't feel uh, able to do what we really want to do. But we pray as we step out and we, de we have this desire to, to be part of your your work, just as Jesus did when he said to his mother, you know, Mum, I must be about my father's business. Please put that in our hearts and minds, that we, uh, that we be willing to step out. And as we do that, we know that you will strengthen and guide and, and keep us uh, not just engaged, but keep us focused and, and part of it. So we thank you for this and we just all of us here just commit our lives to you for this purpose. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.